Hi, I'm uh, Jim Turner. I'm, um, as you can see, uh, work at Sheffield Hall University, and I um, had the privilege of doing this, um, completing this study a couple of years ago, and more um, so. Now I think, gosh, how important is it that we work and think about young people's psychological well-being? So, because uh, I've decided to de dedicate the last few years of my nursing working career to young people's mental health, and. So I've been trotting around the schools in Sheffield recently actually doing psychological well-being sessions for um, pre-A-level students and the like and, uh, and they're going down really well. It's really nice to, uh, um, to have that contact with people and also to have the flexibility to do it. So, um, so and, and some of it's informed by this study which is great actually and so the RCN Foundation funded this um, which of course they've got a reasonable um, uh, set of grants every year and um, and we were lucky to be offered you know the opportunity to complete it and it's it was a scoping group and review and the Delphi okay and a scoping review as you know is a really good scratch around the literature okay a really good scratch around slightly more than a critical review slightly less than a systematic review but it was um you know that it was quite comprehensively done and um and tragically actually the, the scoping review was done by myself, but primarily by Deborah, Lucy, Amy, and Kerry. Unfortunately, Deborah's died since the. Um, we um, so we sort of um, uh, everything I publish, I make sure I put Deb's name on because it, she, it was just a, she's a terrible loss to us. She was such a great researcher within our team. So when um, oh, there you go, I'll have a moment of pause. That really upsets me a bit. But the, so um, so the scoping review was um, was gigantic. Okay, it felt gigantic. We had. Um, like 8,000 papers that we initially searched through and then we um, we got rid of duplicates which is not bad, it just shows how many duplicates are in the system don't they and then we had um, as a team we had um, an inter a reliability exercise to see what was in and what was out and we um, so we screened we screened 5,400 between us because we were trying to get nursing led interventions and this was our rub with it, you see, because when we got down to the bottom, we only got 18. 18 out of 5,400 papers. And that's, um, and that's because other people research nursing, isn't it? We're not necessarily res researching nursing ourselves. Other people are doing it to us. And, uh, and we really want, um, for me, you know, I'm a, I'm a, you know, as Karen is and many of us, are, um, as well as a nurse, I'm a psychological therapist and I'm a, a leader of nurses and the like. And I want us to claim territory for ourselves. I want us to be with claim, claiming Dasein, you know, that being with people. Because for me, that's fundamentally what we do for a living. And I say to people often, when I, in fact, your PhD, that I was in the classroom that afternoon and I talked about Dasein with people. And I talked about the importance of being with. And I normally say, I came, became a psychiatric nurse so I could smoke fags and drink tea with people, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, not to do some of the stuff that we have to do, which is complicated, you know. So, um, so uh, what we got out of these studies, we got 18. A lot of them were by school nurses, uh, by paediatricians, midwives, mental health people in A&E, community epilepsy and students. We mostly found preventative interventions, early interventions and condition management stuff, okay. And um, I'll come to these emerging topics as we go through because I'm having a bit of a gallop. Now, if you don't know me, what I do is I develop a terribly comprehensive PowerPoint presentation and often ignore it. So, but I always enable people to have the PowerPoint later on so they can read it in their own time and then come back to me with questions. Okay, so I am gonna, don't feel cheated when, you, when, I, when I go slide, click, and then it's, just, it's gone because um, uh, you can have a read of it in your own time and ask me questions. So, um, so this is just a little um, pictorial representation of where people were from the studies. 13 um, preventative, 8 hospital based, 5 school based, 5 community based and 5 were reactive in relation to developing you know, a need and a study in relation to a need. Um, 10 of them were typical experimental designs, 3 of them were computer based inter interventions. Of course, you know, we, um, myself and a colleague of mine, John Painter at Hallam, we did a big, quick, pretty big study a few years ago up in North Tyne where we started into digital interventions. And literally, as we were about to publish our results, we went into lockdown and everybody started doing di digital interventions. So we're now looking, thinking, okay, well, what do we learn from that experience? You know, that actually everybody, given if they have to, end up and have to do them, don't they? But we learned quite a lot a bit about the texture around that, about rooms and access and the like, anyhow. So the um, results generally, um, but because they were peer reviewed, they were, they were favorable and interesting, but mostly, we got like intervention studies. So nurses were doing studies about interventions, okay, by nursing students 
mentors to deliver community health programs in, about urban forests. Fascinating stuff. We found a wonderful study in um, in Cornwall where instead of going to um, uh, see a counsellor, you um, you went to, you were referred to the surf school. In fact, it was on the telly recently on the news. You know, so you had a surfing intervention, which was. And I'm a walking psychotherapist at the moment. I've got a few of my patients I go for a walk with, and one recently said when I met him, he says. At the end, I said, how was, that, how, was that, how was that conversation? He said, you know, I can't believe it, Jim. I was so anxious before meeting you. And literally, as soon as we started to walk, my anxiety went and the conversation flowed. And, I, and I'm thinking, surf school for, young, for younglings, you know, what a great idea. You know, forest exercise, and green space and, and the like. You know, really important, isn't it, to enable people. And we run a thing called MindFit at Hallam, where we, as an alternative to counselling, where the students come to us and we do a Couch to 5K which I can present it another day, because that was quite interesting. Um, so, uh, so intervention studies were, um, were uh, helpful, okay? Other, the other intervention studies were um, um, well-being outcomes and nurse-delivered interventions utilising nurse and support relaxation. Of course, you can hear a lot of what we're doing at the moment, mindfulness, relaxation, green space, psychological therapies and the like. Um, uh, Ella Wakari and... Uh, I I can't say that. I evaluated that I can actually, I can allow on. I evaluated in fact resilience training, of course with people I love the idea of resilience at the moment, you know, post pandemic, how resilient are young people? I'm not sure actually, you know, it's two years is a long time in your life if you're fourteen, isn't it? So, you know, not much of our life is a current. But you know, but two <laughs> years is a long time for younglings, isn't it? And rightly so. I hear in the news in the last few days there's quite a lot of focus and emphasis around young people's psychological well-being at the moment. So, um, the other, another intervention study by Walker, they did it. They were used journaling um, project for inpatients with psychosis to identify that. So again, we know journaling is quite a useful way of understanding and managing ourselves, isn't it? So those are those are the only three intervention studies. You know, forest schools journaling and, uh, and, and mindfulness and, and resilience. The screening studies was about utilising screening tools, which I think, you know, for me, absolutely essential. I've just, um, you know, I, I, every patient I see, I automatically screen using various schedules. I think every psychiatric nurse should, frankly, you know. And then because you've got a beginning, you've got a measure and an end, haven't we? And then we can sort of fight our corner in relation to the relationship by saying, well, look, actually, this is working and uh, other things are working like you know the effects of medicines we can then speak with knowledge company as opposed to speaking with uh, with kind of having made it up on the spot so uh, but of course the thing about scre um, screening tools time pressures and constraints have also got to be considered because they take time don't they and restructure studies were about um, organizing reorganizing care pathways and the like and uh, and you know what happens don't you sometimes we we reorganize a service we just shuffle people around don't we and that at one point in sheffield we had a thing called a uh, 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 se uh, sector team and a um, a rehab type team and you know where we did neuroses in one and psychoses in the other now they was all clumped back together again and it doesn't necessarily work well does it because you've got nice paradigms for each of those nowadays so and there were some evaluative studies about um using i can't remember this off the top of it, exactly oh, just evaluating what people were doing and some of the stuff that came up was things like liam let's introduce anxiety management which is a cracking tool and the um the uh Solihull intervention, you know, for um, school nurses. Okay, so um, I skip this because uh, I don't. We're meant to. It's a sort of methodological seminar, isn't it? So, uh, but that's um, in essence what we got from eighteen papers. Eighteen papers from five thousand four hundred was th that nurses were doing these involved in these three different types of uh, study. Okay, and then we moved on. So we took that and went. All right, that's interesting. And we took some stuff out of it, and we framed a Delphi. Okay. And if do you know, you know what Delphi is? No? Okay, do you know the oracle? Some people do. So the oracle of Delphi is um, over there where the sun shines. Okay, so people would go to the oracle of Delphi and say, Dear Oracle, I was thinking about doing this, what do you think? And the Delphi would go, well, You know, based on my considered opinion, you should do this or not do it. Okay, so it's that sort of it's a space where people went to. It's actually a physical space in, um, in, um, in the um, Mediterranean. And of course, um, what, what you can do with a Delphi is you can manage big numbers of people, like really big numbers of people. Okay, and this was a UK-wide study. So we wanted to capture nurses from um, England, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, okay. which of course made us a bit of a headache for ethics. I didn't think it was going to be a headache, but it was a headache. And that's the thing about big, you know, not big, but you know, multi 
country studies, they, they, you think it's going to be a smooth process and then it, it turns into a complicated um, thing. Okay, but, but the beauty of, it, um, of Adelphi is you, you can manage experts in a group and you can manage the voice. So everybody actually has exactly the same power of their voice. So nobody, you know, when you've got a group of people, I know what it's like, isn't it? You go in a room and there's, there's people in a room who you kind of, you know, you go, oh, crikey, you know, where am I in relation to them? And you're, you're less inclined to speak. But in Adelphi, everybody gets exactly the same platform. So the power balance is really nice. And of course, you can have, uh, you can have real reach, you know. Um, I think we, I don't know if it's on the slide, next slide, we had maybe three and a half thousand years of experience of working with children and young people that you captured through this iterative process. And, and the, the basic principle is you, you have a sort of a vague structure that you ask people questions upon. So you send out uh, a capture of uh, for experience and you get, um, uh, you, you everybody, uh, give, everybody gives you a response and then you analyse it and you go into a nice phenomenology land you know, and, you, and you immerse yourself in the data and you come up with X number of statements, say 100 statements or something and you send them back out to everybody and say, you know what, all of you said this, I wonder what you now think about what each other have said. Again, flattened power hierarchy, so nobody's got any ex ex exceptional leadership or leverage and people vote on those. And then on a full Delphi, you send it back out again on a third round. We only did a modified two round for this. So you, so you get a general set of consensus statements about all young, younglings should have access to cognitive behavioral therapy. And then you ask everybody, what do you think? And everybody goes, oh yeah, bang an idea, Jim. And, uh, and, then you, and then you ask them again, then you analyze that, then you ask them again, you say, you know, you said last time it was about 60% agreement with this, but actually everybody else, says about 90. Do you, do you, what do you think now? Are you swayed by the, uh, the other people's opinion? And then you end up with a, with a, you know, a, a, a cut-off point. So the, the, you sort of set yourself a, an arbitrary number like anything above 75% is consensus. And, you, uh, and then you say, well, actually, this statement is really powerful. And it's backed up by X amount of uh, knowledge and experience. Of course, the problem with Adelphi is the fib, isn't it? You know, and Adelphi is not always right because Oedipus went to the Delphi, and the Delphi was bribed to tell Oedipus to go off and have sex with his mother. So, uh, so not all Delphis can be that's the, all can be true. You have to you have to question, you know, you have to still question the process and question the, 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 the veracity of the data. So, um, so yeah. So, in terms of ethics, um, it clearly was a because um, we were asking staff. We tried we tried initially to float it above the NHS thinking we would get a really good response rate through mental health academics, you know, you know all of our networks, but we didn't. And, uh, and so we kind of went, and I went, well, it was worth a shot. And so then we went to the HRI, who were amazing, actually. I really, I had a, such a lovely dialogue with the, with the woman who was r overseeing this study at the HRA. And the key thing is this is, you know, you've got to be unbelievably pernickety. Every single document you submit has to have You don't, don't, you know, when it comes to HRA ethics, don't think you can, you know, you think, oh, this is good enough and send it in. It's a message for students who are doing studies. It's got to be perfect. Every single document's got to be right, you know, that, and it's got to follow their, their guidance. And then, of course, so we got approval, HRA for England. And then I, with my learning curve, woof, like that, for England and Wales, but not Scotland and Northern Ireland. So then I had to apply for access to Scotland via another arm of HRA in Scotland and so that took time and then at the same time Northern Ireland was on strike or trying to access anyone and so it was really you know we managed to get some responses from people academics in Northern Ireland but not some of the practitioners and Wales had a we sort of I thought the NIHR because I was collaborating with them was going to help me manage the the conversations with the areas and it didn't happen so I ended up then having to have so much contact with individual trusts who are still in contact with me now saying oh Jim is that a study over did you publish anything and I go yeah, you know that that's a, that that's like a it was, a, it was unbelievable the kind of the, the tendrils that I had to knit together to enable it to happen so uh, so whilst I thought somebody was doing something they weren't actually they were just going oh yes great idea but not actually then pro progressing it so then I had to progress it so so watch yourself with ethics you know it's a really interesting process I think doing ethics because it makes you 
um, a completer finisher but there's certain things like version numbers and dates and everything you just have to make sure that they're all exactly aligned because if you accidentally upload one that says version 3 and HRA have seen version 4 they'll just bin it and, uh, and ask you to resubmit it again okay so um so I, I I love a bit I love Adelphi I'm really fond of I love kind of action research I love the the idea of meeting people and going on a journey and then rolling data along and then going back to them and saying what do you think you know and making a making a suggestion and then you know rolling another cycle of uh, of, of action research as part of that so I think that um they're 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 a lot of fun and, and get involved lots and lots of conversations so we had um please we had 244 responses. Um, some of them were, were empty responses, unfortunately. People, I think they were um, uh, trust research ethics committees going on, actually, and checking out what we were doing and looking at the, at the information and then not filling it in. So it was a little bit frustrating. But, um, but when we ended up, we looked, we had 4,628 years of experience collectively across. That's quite a lot, isn't it? Do you know, I think that about my team. You know, I've got 23 academics at Helen. And when we, and, uh, and there's some crusty old academics like me who've been around, you know, nursing for nearly 40 years, you know, and others who are a much younger to, to, to the team and, and, and nursing. But, you know, you, you ask the room a question, because I've asked this room a question, we'd get automatically 500 years of experience addressing that question. Right? And that organisation stuff, for the memory, is incredibly important, isn't it? That knowledge, that depth of knowledge that we can get from collaborating with each other. So, um, and we identified loads and loads of these wonderful interventions. Don't, that was my time. I you're okay, you're okay. I was, you've got, you're not getting a five minute warning for another three minutes. Oh. Eight minutes. Schoenbeer. Okay, so <laughs> one year's study, 5,000 years of experience in eight minutes. Let's see where we get to, shall we? Um, so, uh, round two of the Delphi, we ended up with 42 responses. That's how we go, you get washed out. So about 100 people, was, you know, meaningful data in the first round. You send it out again, people have moved on. People have lost interest, some people stay engaged. So we got four to responses, and we analysed all of these different interventions out of what people were saying. Remember, young people, psychological interventions, nurse-led for young people. What are nurses doing? And um, and so early interventions. Unsurprisingly, everybody said, "Fab, yeah, we do early interventions. We're confident in early interventions, but we don't necessarily have the type of practice, which is troubling, isn't it? And but we think it's incredibly important. So there's a little bit of a dissonance there, isn't there, with, uh, with that. And the early interventions were in schools, 35, that's pretty good, isn't it? But again, a lot of school nurses in Scotland replied. And that's like one of the reasons why I'm doing my work in schools at the moment, is because I think, I think we should have a psychiatric nurse in every school in the country, actually, you know, doing psychological well-being support for the practitioners there, because we are slightly more knowledgeable and experienced than uh, some of the people who are working within schools. And it'd be a great team, wouldn't it? You know, and our CAMS or outreach teams, quite a bit lot of projects across the country, where CAMS are doing psychological therapy or outreach into schools, okay. especially now post COVID. So, and this family nurse partnership model, the particular model which is very popular in Scotland at the moment, okay? So, well, early interventions, they loved them. CBT was the next big tick. Now, of course, they are terribly good at their um, publicity and research and evidence basing, aren't they, CBT? But, you know, I use CBT as part of my practice with everybody, with every patient I see actually, and I'm, a, I'm an integrative therapist, so, we're, and so we know how, it, how useful it can be. So we know it's terribly effective, uh, we, know, we know it's effective, I think it's, there was a varying degree of importance, but actually people weren't confident because they didn't have the right training in it, you know, they're not, we haven't found a way of supporting people properly. The DB, DBT was interesting, though, how much that appeared, okay. And I believe this is a really positive model for young people with emotional regulation problems. Of course it is, because it's all about emotional dysregulation, isn't it, and helping people manage that. So there was, again, <coughs> effective, important, but actually people not feeling terribly confident in doing it. Um, family and system, system, systemic practice, which is classic, I'm sure. When I first started off my career, I read um, Barker's, not, not our Phil Barker, but a different Phil Barker book on systemic family therapy. It was really interesting. And it's so... Um, systemic practice again people you think people working with young people would be confident wouldn't you in managing families and, and wider relationships but they're not fully confident um the family nurse partnership model again had, had got a real traction but um but there are some people saying that confidence literally under no circumstances and the thing about when you're managing a delphi you want to in my world you want to have extremes you know so when you like a scale instead of it being a five point scale which is Oh yes, of course, or 
Uh, yeah, m possibly, and not in, uh, no decision or um, uh, whatever the rest of it is. You want to have extremes where absolutely under no circumstances should this happen, or unquestionably, of course, always. You know, so seven point scales for me work a little bit better than fives because you, you touch the extremes. Of course, then that gives you a, um, a, 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 a decent table at the end of it. And of course, the other thing you, then whilst, I'm a, whilst this is a qualitative research um, forum, you need somebody who knows how to dance around SPSS because, uh, because um, part of managing a, 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 a three, certainly a three iteration at Delphi is you need somebody who knows how to do those calculations in, in SPSS so that every person can then know what they scored first time, what somebody else has scored, what the whole group says second time, and then how that relates to their final question. So there's quite a bit of statistical depth in it. Now, ask me about SPSS, and I don't even know how to turn it on, but I know somebody who does. You know, and that's the thing about research, isn't it, is you need to know. You don't have to know everything but you just have to have to have access to some of the people who, who do know stuff. So my, my colleague was, he was extraordinary. He just sat at my desk on my computer and did amazing things. Not tidied up, you know, which is probably me contemplating my data as well, you know, whilst I was at it. But I tidied up around him whilst he worked at SPSS. I thought it was a perfect relationship. Um, okay, so um, solution-focused therapy show. I like that bit of traction. I'm quite fond of solution-focused therapy. But again, people um, lacking a bit of confidence in it. Motivational interviewing, increased confidence, uh, mindfulness and relaxation, increased confidence, effectiveness and importance. Okay, behaviour management, again, number two of young people, we know that we can modify anybody's behaviour, don't we, given the right level of reward. Um, the Solihull approach is a particular, again, a young people's um, intervention package, and there was, that was a varying um, uh, response rate, but I think that was because um, people in Scotland didn't even know about it and people in England didn't really know about the family partnership model, so there was a little bit of um, confusion there. Uh, therapeutic relationships and counselling, okay? This, um, everybody thinks that the relationship is incredibly important. Look at that, it's really only, there's absolutely nothing here, isn't there? You know, the relationship is everything, isn't it? And the effectiveness of the relationship is everything. Remember, you can get by with a good relationship and a bad technique better than you can with a bad relationship and a good technique, can you? Okay. Um, and so, and people were generally confident in the relationship. Group interventions, mixed. Um, use of different assessment schedules. We, we, were trying to, we were trying to get stuff that people were using, because again, I like intervention schedules. Um, creative interventions, loads of them actually. Forest schools, surf tonic therapy, um, uh, uh, ACES pilot, uh, walking and talking exercise, five ways to well be, which I'm terribly fond of as well. And, uh, and we ended up with, um, I think, a reasonable training program. And one of the things I've been wanting for years is um, core training programs across the UK for people, practitioners, working with people to say, how do you work with people with complex personalities? How do you work with people who are with psychosis? How do you work with people who are depressed and anxious? You know. And so, um, stop. So, uh, this is our evidence-based training program for working with young people. You need to understand child development, end of. Some people didn't. You need to have a working knowledge of CBT. You need to get grab hold of first aid. You need a good holistic risk of formulation, and particularly formulation, not just assessment, okay? Um, you need to understand interpersonal theory, and this was about literally building on some of the child development stuff. Has to be contextual. Strengths and resilience works there. That motivational interview, which is very well embedded in um, health visiting and school nursing, anyhow. Recognition of trauma, family systems, attachment, and DBT. And I'll just go right to <laughs> the end. And it's over. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I tell you, you really raced to the finish line there, Jim. But you have still got a bit of time for questions because we've yeah. protected that time. So you, I feel like you probably need it. And the refreshments have just arrived. Oh, perfect timing. But okay, sorry, that's a lot of stuff, isn't it? Because I, I was trying to do method as well as stuff, because I think stuff's important, isn't it? Yeah, no, you know.
So, you know, what is that telling us that, that, that you yeah. know, the pandemic's had a massive impact on children, hasn't it? Yeah. And I do worry about their resilience and what that's going to mean for the future. Yes, well, it was really worrying, wasn't it? Because the, the ONS report has just come out, hasn't it, recently about young people's psychological well-being. And we know that there's an increase in self-harm. We know there's, an, there's a terribly long waiting lists for CAMS. And so I, I, for me, I think um, I, I, I think it's enabling schools. That's my, and that's why I started to enable schools, you know, work with some of the schools in my patch, because I do think that's, um, I've always wanted to put a fence at the top of the cliff anyhow, you know, as opposed to a hospital at the bottom. That's always been my mission ever since I became a nurse, you know, to, you know, I came across my first acute ward and they didn't do groups. And after a few months we were doing groups because I think they're useful and, you know, they're, they're helpful to, they're therapeutic, aren't they? You know, we're trying to create therapy all the time. So, so I think that's the, 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 there's two answers really. One is we need an organisational infrastructure that says, Anybody work with children and young people? This is a fair program. Why don't you? Why don't we find a way of funding it and making it happen? And I think, and I'd love that. I'm, I'm a bit of a fan of the old EMB courses, you know, that where um, where you, if you're working in camps, there was a specific skills training course for you. Not a course that enabled you to go off and do something else, but a skills training. If you worked on an acute ward, there was a skills training course for you. If you worked with people with com complex personalities, there was a skills training to enable you to do that better. And of course, we've got so many. You know, I'm talking that. You know, nearly 40 years ago, where we didn't have such a such a database of uh, of useful and proven interventions to help people. You know, DBT wasn't around then, was it? It is now, and it's got a really good traction. And why why wouldn't it? Because it talks about the invalidating experience and helping people with their uh, emotional regulation. Seems exactly right to me, doesn't it? You know. So that's my what my hope is that we that we've got a, that we find a way of. CAMs are reaching into schools and psychiatric nurses working and of course the, the digital world is there isn't it there's so many really useful digital platforms that people can access but they're not everything are they you know we know that not everybody grasps hold of them and makes the best use of them and sometimes you just need to be with don't you and not tippy tap in the brain and be human yeah. Oh, that's the that's surf school. That's the alternative to uh, it's the alternative to um, so younglings instead of being referred to counselling, they get referred to the surf school. And they go surfing. And they go surfing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think actually a lot of those into where um, what some of the initiatives which I'm trying to set up at the moment, Shepherd, one of them is around the post-COVID bereavement group, which is about using um, green space and walking. And there's a the, the mind fit thing that we run is. Um, it's it's um, it's fascinating because of course it's um, all groups are generally speaking more effective than one to ones, isn't it? So we've had 27 people on the Mindfit who would have had taken up 27 hours of therapy, but they actually only have three hours with two people for that. So we got six into you know it's three times more efficient, isn't it? And so we have a conversation whilst we're walking to the green space, and then we have a little run around. Some of them run, ah, yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and so we've got different levels of groups because then that's, the, that's again that's nice, isn't it? And they um, and then we do a, a, de a bit of psychoeducation debrief. So we do a bit of mindfulness, mindfully strong, um, a bit of CBT, a bit of resilience, a bit of um, uh, understanding, uh, understanding you know anxiety, depression, the like. And, and then we all culminate in a in a, in a park run with a celebration event. And, and but actually there's more to it. You know, it's like everything that sort of stuff that. The walk actually is quite significant, isn't it? Because it's an unstructured um, conversation. The actual exercise, Stuart said, it was really interesting. That actually, as I because I exercised, it made me pay more attention to my studies, and I was able to manage my studies better because I had the confidence because I joined that group. You know, whereas actually sitting in a counselling group might not have been as effective as that group. So, but we didn't do a controlled study. We just kind of went, what a good idea. Let's get on with it and evaluate it. So yeah, so that, those, that kind of using space is great. I, I'm, I'm interested that you know you're talking to people in schools, and from what you've heard, what do the young people say? Oh well, uh, well, well, the structure for the schools is, I've um, I, I've structured it as a as a sort of a psychological self help program. So. 
I talk about the five ways to well-being and get them all to do with five ways. Um, and if, if, you, if you do all of the five ways, connect, look after your body, be mindful, give. You know, so there's that, um, and not knowledge at six, so one of them's got two. The, um, so I, I, we do that, I talk to them about that, about how I manage that every day and how I think they ought. And then they do a little plan and then I shift them into a, a little bit about fish, about being present, choose your attitude and have fun. And then I talk a little bit about CBT. We do a, and we do a five systems because I'm a simple man. I think that, you know, I really, I, I've never been, whilst I love Heidegger and I love complicated theory, when you teach people, as you know, you know, it's lost, isn't it? So you want to, you want it digestible. So I teach these little bite-sized self-help chunks. And they said, what I got back was, I cannot believe, Jim, how everybody paid attention to you. I've never had, I've never seen an assembly like it, which I was, which was lovely feedback actually. And I've never known anybody an, an assembly so engaged as they were today. So it was clearly important to them, and that's why I took away. And I didn't, I didn't take it away. It's like, oh yeah, I had a great experience. I took it away, going, this is really important to these young people. You know, it's just a really straightforward toolkit to enable themselves to help just manage and actually you know doing the five systems with people a couple of weeks before their exams where you help them manage that thought or to be a helpful thought was a 